Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the full-bodied online training course that's an intriguing blend of spices, wood, and peppers. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about packet-switched WAN technologies. This is a module that is in, works in combination with the circuit-switched WAN technologies we did just prior to this, and it comes from Section 2.5 of our Network Plus certification requirements. We're going to talk about what a packet-switched WAN technology is. First, we know that there are different kinds. There is ATM Sonnet and these OC3, OC12, OC48 technologies. We'll talk about those. We'll also talk about DSL technologies, the A, S, and V flavors of those. There is a packet switch technology called Frame Relay. There's another one called MPLS. It's very common today. And finally, we'll discuss cable modems, satellite, and wireless networks. Now, packet switch technologies themselves are interesting because the, unlike the circuit switch technology, packet switch technologies means that we're taking data, we're putting it into packets, and we're sending it out over the wide area network. Now, this allows us to send voice, to send data, to send video. It is not just like a network. It is a network. This is exactly the way our traditional local area networks work these days. We've just applied that way of communicating out to our wide area networks. The media itself is usually shared with other people. You don't ever see those other people on a WAN link, but the, the provider that is giving you that WAN link, they're allowing other people to take advantage of the resources that they've built centrally. So generally, our costs are a little bit less than if we had created a circuit-built technology because it's a less cost for the provider. So even when you're not using the network, at least other people can take advantage of the resources, the lines, the fiber, and the equipment that the provider has put in place. Now, one connection may have more bandwidth allocated than the other. So one, one customer to the provider may be getting a big pipe and a lot of bandwidth. You may be getting a smaller or larger amount of bandwidth, and they can size it appropriately. Just depends on how much money generally you want to spend. The more money you spend, the bigger the pipe. And that way, you really got a lot of flexibility there. The provider can build out a big infrastructure and simply carve out little pieces that are just for you and provide you even with guarantees that you'll be able to send that amount of traffic through, even though it's a shared resource. Let's start our tour of packet-based WAN technologies with one called Sonnet. ATM and OC3, OC12, OCX. This stands for Synchronous Optical Networking. That's what Sonnet is. And what this allows us to do is take a single strand of fiber, but multiplex inside of that fiber many different types of communication streams. So this was really designed for the provider that needed to take a lot of different customers' data and put it over single fiber. Perfect for packet switch technologies. You don't build one circuit per customer. You build one circuit for everybody and simply interleave everybody's traffic along that single fiber that you've built. So extremely efficient in the way that it works. One very common protocol that used this technology is one called asynchronous transfer mode, ATM. And it's most commonly transported over a sonnet type connection. ATM was interesting because it was unlike any other type of networking topology we'd seen so far. You have these things called cells, and we call them cells because every piece of packet that went through an ATM network was 53 bytes long, and there were separate little spaces between them, and it was always streaming through the network. Whether there was data inside of those cells or not, there was this constant stream, a very common stream of ATM traffic going through the network, so it was spaced very evenly. And the providers love this because it was we expect certain things to come through the network in a certain time frame and we could time everything perfectly we didn't need a separate set of clocking just to be able to handle knowing what's happening on the other side of the connection because we know we're always going to be getting 53 bytes and a standard gap 53 bytes and a standard gap regardless of whether traffic was coming through the network or not the speeds of these connections we call oc optical carrier levels and oc1 stands for a 51 1,000 kilobits per second or 51 megabits per second. When you get to OC3 speeds, which was really one of the first very high-speed networking types we had with ATM, it was 155 megabits per second. So it was a very high-speed network for the time when 100 megabit Ethernet was really our maximum. ATM went a little bit farther than that and even went up to OC12 type speeds. Although you're getting more speeds, you're getting a little more expensive. The fiber type's different. The lasers that are used inside the fiber connections are different. But Look at the speed, 622 
megabytes per second. So very, very high speed connectivity. And then finally, OC48, you're looking at 2 gigabit, 2.4 gigabit per second through these OC48 links. And even today, these wide area network providers, these uh, large providers of network that give us connections in our environments over a wide area network are using these sonnet rings to be able to communicate at speeds that are OC12, OC48, and even higher. And because they're able to send so much traffic through there, even though you're not running at 622 megabytes per second, when you put everybody's traffic on the link, it's using a lot of that bandwidth. And that's one of the great advantages you have with packet switch technologies is that we can do that. We can build these extremely large pipes and just send everybody through it. And on the other end, it figures out who is who and sends it to the right place. One very common type of networking these days is DSL. And the kind that we usually have in our homes and our businesses these days is asymmetric digital subscriber line. That's what the DSL piece is. And this uses our existing phone line. So we don't have to run new wires to all of our houses to use this DSL connectivity. So there's a big advantage there. We really have limitations, though, over how far we can be from our central office. Generally, it's about 10,000 feet from our central office, plus or minus. It depends on what type of interference there is in the area. It depends on the type and the quality of wiring that we have in the ground. But generally, we can get some pretty long distances from the central office for this. It's called asymmetric because the speed of the download is much faster than the speed of the upload. And there's many reasons for this from a technical perspective, but it certainly allows the provider to bill you differently for the types of speeds that you're using. Generally, in the United States anyway, we get somewhere around up to 24 megabits per second downstream. That's a pretty extreme case. Generally, it's around 5 to 10. And uh, the highest speeds we've seen so far in the US, 3.5 megabit upstream or more. This, the standards, anyway, certainly allow for that. But your bandwidths are going to differ depending on how far away you are from that central office. Now, there's also a DSL type called symmetric DSL. And symmetric means that the speed of the download is equal to the speed of the upload. However, this standard was really never, ever standardized. There was no specific standard. It was very specific to manufacturer's equipment. And therefore, it really wasn't, wasn't really sent out and implemented in very many environments. What you're seeing these days is really the next step up, which is VDSL, which stands for Very High Bit Rate DSL. Especially in Japan and other environments, you can see that 4 megabit through 100 megabit per second speeds for DSL are extremely fast, especially for what we have here in the United States. So this Very High Bit Rate DSL is one that's probably going to become more popular as the standard gets rolled out in more places. One of the first packet switch WAN technologies to came along after the, the T1 was something called Frame Relay. And Frame Relay was great. It was one of the first WAN types that was really cost effective because it had this packet switching inside the cloud, what we call the provider's network. We had some great benefit and some economies of scale here. It was a departure from the circuit switch T1s because all the traffic left our router, went into what we call the Frame Relay cloud, which was the provider's network. And then as the end user, we really don't care what happened. What really happened inside of it was there were switches inside the Frame Relay network that sent the packets through a bunch of different switches till it finally got to its endpoint and then went out to the local link to the, the remote site over the wide area network. It was great because we could just take our LAN traffic, we could pack it up in a Frame Relay frame and send it across the WAN, and then it magically ended up at the place that it needed to be. Once it went into the cloud, we really didn't care what happened to it. The provider's clouds are extremely complex, many, many switches, a lot of redundancy, a lot of fault tolerance. What we really cared about is we just gave it off to the provider, and it magically appeared on the other side. That's exactly what you want from a wide area network. The speeds on Frame Relay were also very nice because we weren't locked in to a specific T1 speed. We could go very slow, or we could crank up the speed and have very high speeds if we were plugged into a Frame Relay network over DS3. So a lot of advantages from a speed perspective. What you're finding is many people aren't putting in Frame Relay anymore. They're putting in something called MPLS. It is the newer style of being able to do packet switching over wide area networks. MPLS stands for Multi-Protocol Label Switching. And it's very interesting the way it works, very similar to Frame Relay in many ways. But it is a newer style that gives us some capabilities because it's something called a push and a pop. I'm pushing things onto the network into this MPLS cloud. And they finally get to this provider edge that sticks a label onto it that says, oh, you need to go to the other side. And once it goes into the cloud into something called a label switch router, 
it's up to those label switch routers to, to figure out the best way to get it to the other side. And at the other side, the provider pops off the MPLS piece and just provide you back with your LAN connectivity. So it's a little bit more advanced than Frame Relay where we as the end user was packaging the Frame Relay and throwing it out to the provider. Here we're just giving the provider some traffic and it's taking care of all the encapsulation for us. It's taking care of getting the packet from one end to the other. Very, very simple from an end user perspective to be able to use. Inside of the cloud, it's extremely resilient and redundant. So we've got a lot of extra economies of scale there. Very easy to use. We just ask for an MPLS link, we get usually an Ethernet connection from our provider, and then we just send everything out over that Ethernet connection. So very easy to use in that scenario. Some of the more modern packet-based technologies, packet switch technologies, are things like cable modem, satellite, and wireless. Cable modems, we've become very popular in the our home environments especially because we're using this cable that's come in for our cable television. It's exactly the same cable. It's still running our television signal over it. And it uses a standard called DOCSIS, Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. DOCSIS allows us for some very high speeds. Even today, we're seeing some of the newer cable modem technologies rolling out at about 100 megabits per second. So we're seeing slowly and surely, at least in the United States, we're starting to get higher and higher speeds out of some of these cable modem networks. If you're somewhere where you don't have access to cable television, especially in these rural environments, you may have something called satellite connectivity. Satellite uses these non-terrestrial links. We're going up to a satellite and back down again to be able to complete the circuits and send the packets across them. And that satellite is doing the packet switching. A lot of different people using that single satellite. It does require some external equipment. We got to put a, a satellite receiver and satellite transmitter, transmitter out in the yard. The latency is also very long compared to what you'd have if you stayed on the planet Earth because you have to send that traffic all the way up to the satellite. It has to come all the way back down again. So there is a, a, a physics still apply whenever we're sending those packets back and forth. But we still get some very high rates of speed, up to 5 megabit per second in our latest round of satellite communication. And then finally, you're probably very familiar with the wireless 802.11 communication we have. Some of the very common uh, wide area network wireless is using some of those mobile or even 802.11 to span different buildings, for instance. So a very common packet switched wide area network technology. Let's review some of the things that we've learned about packet switch networks. Our first question is, what does the A in ADSL stand for? Our DSL technologies we know could send traffic in one speed and receive traffic in another with ADSL, and that's where it gets its term for asymmetric. Our next question is, what WAN transport is usually associated with the ATM protocol? There was a certain type of WAN communication that's used in the United States to be able to send some of that ATM traffic, and it's Sonnet. It's synchronous optical networking. Our last question is, what standard do cable modem data services use? There's a standard these modems use to set up those WAN connectivity, and it's something called DOCSIS, Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. Well, that certainly covers the basis. We've now learned about circuit switched and now packet switch technologies for the WAN. And we've gone through all of these WAN technology types and these WAN properties. If you'd like to watch more of our Network Plus videos, you can participate in our message boards or send me a message. Visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.